And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly! This segment is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, creators of the next generation firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit sans.org to learn more. This segment also brought to you by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the new Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud. Engage your IT department in the vulnerability management process today. Now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer or several, give the intern control of your botnet. Here's your host, still recovering from his love fest with Dave Kennedy last week, Paul Asadorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Paul Security Weekly. This is episode 385 for August 28th, 2014. Very, very happy to be here this evening for the podcast extravaganza we've put together for you. Uh, I have two, uh, actually to my right, but kind of now facing me, which is in our new little studio setup we're trying out here, Mr. Jack Daniel. Greetings. Welcome, glad Jack, to the glad show. Glad to be back with you. I'm, uh, you liking this? I like this new I kinda, setup. I kind of like this. Yeah, it's it's a little more intimate. Although yeah. I was uh, I was afraid you wouldn't want to be intimate after last week. You know, uh, there was a lot of intimacy <laughs> uh, last week, which there. I'm still <laughs> scarred very much for life. Actually, yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, uh, don't worry; it, it'll all get worse in four weeks when we're at DerbyCon. This is true. <laughs> uh, so, those of you who don't know, Dave Kennedy. May I am the news. <laughs> I am the news. <laughs> was here last week. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> so we're looking forward to uh, DerbyCon, where we'll get to see Dave Kennedy. Oh. <laughs> uh, a lot more <laughs> yes. next week. Joff Thayer is uh, here with us on the lines via Skype. Joff, welcome to Security Weekly. Oh, well, thank you, Paul, and good day, everybody. It's great to be back. I have certainly missed everybody the past few weeks for various reasons haven't been on the show so good to see you so joff we're doing this little well i am anyway we started this new thing on the stoey geeks we're going to do a lot more pairings we're trying to branch out and be more sophisticated i guess which doesn't always work out um but <coughs> we are doing more pairings and uh last week on the stoey Geek show we did a beer beer and cigar pairing i really liked my pairing um, so I have a particular variety of cigar that you're not supposed to have here in the United States for this show, uh, paired with an urban wheat ale. If we can hold that up for the for the camera, uh, and it's it's going very well. I'm feeling uh, very zen with my my beer and cigar pairing. Nice so choice. Yes, yes. So we'll we'll see how that pans out throughout the show. If you want more. Pairings with cigars, you can tune into the Stogie Geek Show every Thursday night, immediately following Security Weekly at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, stogiegeeks.com forward slash live. Make sure you tune into that show. Uh, and like I said, we're starting to branch out. So if you want to experience more than just cigars, we're going to do uh, shows where we do cocktails. So we'll talk about the cocktail, how to make the cocktail, variations on the cocktail. Drink the cocktail with a cigar. I, I'm on the so show. glad the cigar pairings went in that direction and not Monica Lewinsky. Yes, no, that's <laughs> a completely different show. <laughs> it's oh, early in the we, show. We, yeah, we do that after <laughs> Stogie Geeks. Um, <laughs> well, if you tune into tune last in week's show, <laughs> yeah. there were some very interesting pairings <clears throat> that took place. Yeah, the, um, the cocktails one we'll have to uh, play with. I'll, I'll bring the the trunk of bitters over for. Uh, yes, some I show. need the one they put in Sazerac. So, so you need uh, Peychaud's. 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 I, I have Peychaud's. a bottle or two of that. I, I yes. have 24, 26 varieties of bitters in my collection. Oh, nice. You'll yeah. have to stick around maybe yeah, one well, week for this. Jack, Jack does not mess around. I yeah. mean, as I learned yeah, yeah, in yeah, Vegas right. recently. You, 
You saw my travel kit uh, in the hotel room. Jack, Jack's uh, travel kit is something to behold. I was quite impressed. <laughs> um, a couple With of announcements. The <laughs> <laughs> The PVS contest from Tenable Network Security. You can register with the link in the show notes. That's wiki.securityweekly.com. Enter a contest to win an AR drone. You must use PVS to find something cool. The details are on the registration page. Join me for an awesome webcast titled Five Things You're Not Doing With Your Vulnerability Scanner. The link for that is also in the show notes. Make sure you register today. I promise I'll keep it real. I'll have ridiculous pictures in the presentation. I'll show you how to stay regular. With your vulnerability scanner, of course. Uh, I, I didn't know Metamucil came along with that. Yes, free bottle of Metamucil to accompany your vulnerability management process. It's for all of those uptight secu- systems administrators, security administrators, maybe? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sands Las Vegas, October 26th through the 27th, will debut a new course titled Embedded Device Security Assessments for the Rest of Us which will teach students how to assess embedded systems of all varieties on penetration tests and in your duties as a security professional. You can register with with the link in the show notes or go to securityweekly.com forward slash IOT. It's going to be an awesome class. You should register. You should join us. It's going to be fun. Uh, Ashley is assisting in the creation of that class, and we have some really super cool things in store for you as well. So well worth two days of your time in Vegas with me. And others, such as Larry Pesci, who is teaching? Who is teaching out there? Yes. Uh, wireless 617, wireless, wireless ethical hacking, penetration testing, and defenses. Sands Las Vegas from October 20th through the 25th. So you can take Larry in class, then you can have me in class, and you can get the full Security Weekly experience, complete with hugs, which we will keep hugs. our clothes on for. I I yeah, that's that's good. That, I, I don't think I'm doing that one this year. I, I, I'll miss that because I do like that. That's uh, uh, you know, all of the Sands events are great. The people that show up for Vegas uh, in that fall one tend to be uh, pretty hardcore, and it tends to make for some uh, pretty interesting conversations from my uh, my perspective. And it's uh, Casa Fuente and Frankie's and Double Absolutely. Down and all the wonders of Vegas. Uh, you can purchase Hack Naked shirts online, shop.securityweekly.com. And now we're going to introduce, uh, introduce our special guests, Um I, I I have one of them in the show notes. I apologize, guys. Uh, Mr. Corey Thune. Did I say that right, Corey? Yeah, that's good. Excellent. Corey's here with us. He's a senior researcher at Digital Bond, an ICS-focused security company. Um, Corey is a, a hacker of all things and uh, likes to modify video game save files in a hex editor, I'm told. Um, he's spent years breaking industrial control systems at Digital Bond. We also have with us Kenneth Shaw. Ken, I don't have a bio for you, so you're going to have to do your own bio. How's that? Oh, great. Uh, I like to hack embedded systems, too. Uh, I've been doing it for a long ass time. Uh, I taught myself how to program with the quick basic help menu. Uh, say anything other weird. Uh, I put implants inside of uh, people's routers and sw- network switches. Nice. And I don't even have to use your, uh, your default passwords that you don't change. It just happens. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, it's a topic we talk about a lot here on the show as it's of great interest to me. I think it's an interesting hobby uh, in terms of embedded systems. So uh, why don't we go around for both of you. How did you get your start in information security? Uh, I'll start. Uh, Kind of like you said, um, the the save game files and uh, and giving yourself infinite lives and that type of a thing. And then from there, it just sort of, uh, that's where you learn the mindset. And then it sort of snowballs from, well, if you can change save game files, can you change network protocols and that type of stuff? Uh, and I guess uh, went to school for computer science and did it all during that. So uh, that's the long and the short of it. Ken, how about you? So uh, probably all started back when I was in high school. Uh, I was the only one that knew anything about computers because I went to a really, really small high school. <laughs> I think my graduating class was like 32. So actually, I... Uh, uh, I actually ended up working for the high school while I was going to school there, and they put me in charge of their networks. Uh, and everybody was locked out of their systems one day, and they couldn't get it back. And the admin had no idea what to do either because he lost his access too. And I had to like break into the Novell system and bring everybody back alive. Awesome, awesome. I love stories that involve Novell. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so now, uh, do you guys both work for Digital Bond, or can do you work someplace different? Or 
No, actually, I, I have my own company. Uh, actually, uh, we both started Southwork Security yeah. about a year ago. Uh, I got sued out of existence, basically. And uh, Corey is going to Digital Bond. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm heading, but I'll find somewhere. Maybe, hopefully, this project that I'm working on will actually uh, come to fruition. What is the uh, current project you're working on? That's the the decam stuff with Besser IO. Yeah, that's so that's the, um, that's okay. yeah, that's what we had uh, at. So Larry came and saw us in the ICS Village. I don't know if Paul, if you made it in there. I was at, at the uh, yeah, I was at the ICS Village at S four. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's yeah, that's the digital uh, bond conference. But this, the one that we did at DefCon was the first one at DefCon. It's different, um, and it's uh, some of the same people, but. Uh, uh, what we had was uh, we, we did the first annual, I think we're coming back next year, uh, Dark Tangent seemed pretty pleased with it anyway, uh, but it was pretty fun. Larry came by. Um, so that's what Ken and I did was our, our project at, at the ICS Village was uh, our skater from scratch uh, that we wanted to do. That was kind of uh, our way of giving the industry a little bit of a kick in the ass. Um, so, cause we've been in, in skater for a while prior. So like Ken said, we started our own company, Southwork security. We did that for about a year and a half. Now we're kind of, uh, splitting off. Um, but before that we were both at Idaho national laboratory for a few years where we did uh, skater security there too. Um, but so we've been around the industry for a while and like you guys know, it, it's, uh, it's kind of ugly in some ways. Insecure by design is a problem. Um, so, so that was sort of our attempt anyway. So what was the, the idea behind the, uh, the ICS Village? Go ahead, Ken. So the ICS Village, uh, it's the first time DEF CON ever did it. Basically, it's a bunch of uh, industrial, uh, industrial control system people from the industry brought a bunch of systems in to, to hack on for people to look at and see what, what is exactly uh, an industrial control system. They brought in, like, uh, there was a bunch of stuff from Phoenix Contact, PLCs, RTUs, there was a Siemens system that I think was the same one that had Stuxnet on it, um, and, and we were there uh, with, our, with our little homebrew device control system thing. So what is the, your homebrew device control system thing? Tell me about that. So it's a, uh, basically, uh, Corey and I were sitting there saying, you know what, why are these control systems so crappy? Um, well, it's because they keep trying to do backward compatibility stuff. Nobody wants to pay for change, and the regulatory industry just says, you know what, it works, don't mess with it. So, so Corey and I were sitting there having a beer, of course, in IBC, uh, the Idaho Brewing Company. I'll get to that later. Ooh. And we were like, you know, we could probably make a secure by design control system really easily. So we sat down, took us 14 days. We busted out a bunch of hardware and software. I'm a, an electrical engineer. So we busted out all this stuff, and lo and behold, we can actually produce stuff that controls devices and processes uh, securely. And you don't need all of this extra stuff like firewalls and, you know, all those good things that make things so much more secure. So what yeah, do you, it was, Go ahead, Corey. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was really fun and interesting because we basically, like Ken said, we sat down and said, how hard could this shit really be? How, I mean, most, a lot of these are solved problems. Uh, and if we can, you know, hit the different disciplines between EE and, and modern software divine design principles and take those and apply it to SCADA, how hard could it be to actually make a system that controls, say, a brewing process, uh, autom automates a brewing process and do it in a secure way that, so uh, that works? What did you guys do differently from uh, the, the traditional SCADA devices don't do in terms of security? So... Uh, we started with the with the basic like premise of if two things are going to talk to each other, as in like machine to machine, then they have to trust each other, and and so that's where we started. And you have to build that trust uh, if you have physical access to the device. Is what we were just basing it off of. Okay, you have physical access to the device. Physical access to the device, you can do whatever you want. So after that point, then we said, okay, well, we can do a key exchange like SSH where you're like, well, I actually have access to the device. I'll copy my SSH key over, you know, I, I, and, uh, and build the trust platform from that. Now, how is that different from like a conventional control system? Well, there's no such thing as trust in conventional control systems. Mm -hmm. If you're on the network, you win. They trust and, everyone. Yeah, they literally Everybody's trust everybody. They don't even bother with default passwords because they're on the trusted networks. So that's good enough. And so, yeah, so basically we tried to build a control system that was based on a trust relationship uh, that you build as the person who owns the system rather than uh, another company or somebody else doing it for you. 
Do, do you think that adds uh, too much complexity in management for folks deploying SCADA systems, or is it just an educational thing, whereas before they had these proprietary networks that weren't connected to anything else, like truly not connected to anything else, uh, so they could trust the network? Um, so is it you know, just a matter of re-educating our systems administrators, or does it add something to the, um, you know, the ICS world where it makes that not feasible? Yeah, that's the that's the hard part, kind of right. PKI is hard uh, managing keys and that type of a thing. So that's one of the goals for what we made was to be able to do that all automatically. So the end user doesn't have to worry about any of that stuff at all. You just uh, like like Ken was saying, you have physical access. So um, what we envision uh, is is you have like an NFC exchange between your mm -hmm. programmer device and the SCADA device, and so you go around and scan all these, which does a key exchange there, and then that enters in the device into your programmer. So you might have a temperature sensor, uh, a valve that controls coolant into your uh, fermenter. Uh, and, and then those two things need to talk to each other. And so you scan those into your control system. But then when you actually program your control system, uh, this is the part where, so Ken's the EE guy. He worried about the sensors and that type of stuff and the key exchange low level. But all of that is hidden from the end user who's going to program the control system. Instead, uh, what we're giving them is a, actually just a JavaScript environment. Uh, a sandbox where they can sit there and they have their hardware exposed to them so they can read the temperature sensor for their fermenter and, and then they can control the whether or not the coolant is going to go if they open the valve or not. And that logic is all written in JavaScript, which is a lot different than what's out there now, mm -hmm. uh, which is a lot of proprietary stuff. And it can be very expensive just to have somebody program your system to work, let alone design it. Mm, I see. Yeah, it, it breeds some economic problems with... Uh within the ICS world. Yeah, that was one of the, that's actually one of the main motivators and why uh, that the Forbes article that uh, came out about what we were doing is called the, the Beery Revolution to fix broken power plants because we had to start with, we, we're, we're trying to aim at this, at this niche of, uh, of people who are big enough to want automation but small enough to not be able to afford it. Mm -hmm. Because right now all the stuff is super expensive which is a little ridiculous because the hardware is crappy and so is the software. Uh, but, but we wanted to create this from scratch thing that people could take and implement themselves that could hit that sweet spot. And that's where the Idaho Brewing Company comes in, which is the beer that Ken and I are drinking this evening, which is very fine, fine, delicious uh, craft beer. Um, so that's where we started, though, because uh, Wolf is the, is the name of the brewer, brewmaster. Um, it, he had to meet the demand, uh, but the automation was just too expensive. And so, so we kind of struck a deal with them. We're like, hey, we'll help you out for free if you give us a chance to, you know, sort of test our stuff in the real world. Because uh, so it was important to have consequences. So you implemented your system for the Idaho Brewing Company? Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, uh, we installed a, a couple of systems. Right now, we're, we're in the process of monitoring a couple of his fermenters, uh, the temperature sensors. Mm -hmm. And we're... Uh, we're, we're, we're watching his current system because even in a small scale system like Idaho Brewing Company, they, they don't trust anything that's new. So we're trying to build the trust even there. Um, but uh, what, we're, what we're getting into is, is installing them in more breweries and more places that can't afford actual control systems. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's a long and painful road to actually get people to trust a system uh, without like enormous monetary funding to actually get it done. ICS are very... Uh, very nervous people They're when it very, comes yes. to new technology. Yes. In yes. case you didn't notice, that's why hacking ICS is like the 90s, mm -hmm. where the, you got glory days of pings of death and stuff. And things is, you can't just end map a SCADA system because a lot of times stuff will just tips over. Yeah, yeah. No, I I've experienced that before. Um, <laughs> I was the number one talker on the ICS village at at S4. I did some serious scanning because I could, and I didn't, you know disrupted just the test networks they had there, not actual ICS networks. So uh, it was good. So Sweet. do you guys you get, back to the beer, do you guys get free beer out of this deal? Is that? Yes. Uh, Wolf is uh, more than more than generous with the beer. Uh, it is freely flowing while we're working there. Uh, I actually I'm got this uh, this growler today was on him because I, I said I'd mention them whenever we did this. That's, what are you drinking, Ken? That's fantastic. Uh, this is the uh, session. He just came out with it. Uh, I think I have a graph of uh, it being brewed. All the data is on our website at Besser.io. Skate is on the interwebs. That's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> you can hack it. Go by all means try. 
So uh, you can you monitor the brewery from your website? Is that? Yeah, that's that's actually that's actually a big part of what uh, what they wanted at the Idaho Brewing Company. So Wolf wanted uh, so he's had a couple batches of beer uh, uh, crap out on him. Basically, his uh, his system that he had running before is a very I would argue is a very expensive system, but it's as cheap as you can get. It's a hundred and thirty dollar temperature sensor which monitors the temperature and you can set a point and it tries to maintain that point with a really poorly implemented uh, control loop. Anyway, so he said, well, if you could put this on the internet so that I can just go look and see if there's a problem that I should come in and, and fix it, that would save me batches of beer every year. Because even though his system is an industrial control system, it's uh, they, they're still not very good. They're still computers, and he doesn't know when they fail unless he stops in at the brewery and looks at them. So we're like, well, yeah, we can put this on the internet. If it fails, we can send you an email. Like all that stuff is super easy, and it's kind of a shame that a, a system that costs one hundred and thirty dollars can't actually do that for you. And we're just using BeagleBum Blacks to do most yeah. of our work. Uh, we have a couple custom uh, circuitry that I've developed, but other than that, it's it's just off the shelf stuff for fifty bucks. So uh, you guys were able to develop hardware and software that does this stuff, it, from what I gather from you guys, way more securely than products that cost a whole heck of a lot more. What is stopping the current manufacturers from producing? What are their roadblocks to producing more secure hardware and software? Uh, a lot of it is uh, certifications. Uh, and, uh, and like we said, the resistance to change What do you mean by uh, certifications? The f fear leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering, and that's the situation that uh, that's that industrial control systems are in at the moment, kind of. In that, uh, uh, usually, I guess it's because the stuff that gets uh, put into systems might be there for ten to twenty years, mm -hmm. at least in the current. Because probably because it's so expensive, but but then you look at things like the Beagle Bone Blacks, right, uh, or Raspberry Pis, which are cheap. Uh, so our thinking was, why not just throw one of those at every single sensor and every single actuator you have in your control system and if it breaks what who cares it's forty dollars just throw it away and get a new one and when and when you're using cheap replaceable components like that then you, that opens up all kinds of doors that you just don't have but uh, isn't the um, paradigm. isn't reliability critical to a lot of right. industrial control systems yeah which uh ken you want to talk about that that's yeah uh, so <clears throat> Reliability is extremely important, and and I would argue that security is a part of reliability, mm -hmm. and, and that's something that a lot of people don't really appreciate all that well. Um, and so, I mean, what is a reliable component? If you're much of an electrical engineer, you go look at the data sheets, and most of them are rated for, you know, X temperature to X temperature, up to 90 degrees C or something like that. Um, well, almost every component is anyway. You you have a hard time finding a component that isn't, and and the di the and the difference in cost is like maybe five dollars a component or something. Like it's actually minimal. Um, so yeah, reliability is extremely important, but there. I, I would argue that there really isn't a whole lot in terms of difference between reliability of components that are fifty dollars versus a thousand dollars. It's really just a thousand dollars that they're tacking on there because <laughs> you think it's more reliable. And I guess the other point is when they cost forty dollars, well, let's put three of them together and have them vote on what the action or what the temperature actually is. If they're that cheap, then I'll just double down and mm -hmm. make it into a raid, basically, where they get to look at what the sensor is saying and make a decision. And if it fails, you'll know about it immediately and yeah, you can that, replace it because it's cheap. That's a really big deal, actually, in the skater realm because patching systems is really hard because you need to be able to test your patch and make sure that it doesn't go down, right? Because reliability is king. Availability uptime is the utmost important. So if you can do things like a skater raid where you have actually three temperature sensors and then they're going to do Byzantine general voting to decide what the actual temperature is, then if one of those goes bad, uh, you know, it's like a raid. You just pull it out and put in a new one and then it syncs up and everybody agrees. Uh, or if you want to do something like run a, a test of your new logic for your process alongside your actual uh, process or, or test patches, uh, you can have your test system right alongside your normal system running off the same data and everything because all the systems are so cheap and next to each other that you can do that in uh, in real time live where it, now that's that's expensive and it's impossible difficult. nowadays yeah mm. 
Interesting. Um, so in what we call the Internet of Things, right, <laughs> uh, where do you folks see the biggest threats that maybe will come to fruition first? Which area of embedded systems do you guys see as posing the biggest risk or threat first? Um, I, so in, in my brief study of what the new Internet of Things is supposed to be exactly, um, it seems to me like it's a lot of systems that actually fail to make any headway as a, as a, as a larger system, like a home automation lighting system. The company folded over, and now they're turning it into an Internet of Things thing. They're just rebranding the same stuff. And a lot of them are just written in the exact same stuff that control systems are written in. They're written in C. They don't actually have any security implemented in them. They don't actually care. They're working off of either like a DNP3 or something like that protocol. And it's just a re-implementation of something that's already been done. So I would say uh, any Internet of Things, things that are coming out right now where they don't actually stress modern technology, which mm -hmm. I don't think any of them really do, uh, those are going to get nailed like so hard in the next cu couple years. Yeah, I think I think my opinion on the issue is that, yeah, the, the rush, because it's such a big word right now, the rush to get products to market is going to be what hurts security, right? Because yeah. security is always an afterthought. So you, you try and band-aid that on after your product's released because you got to make money first. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be the biggest problem to the Internet of Things. Now, we definitely see the home um, kind of almost benefiting from some of these Internet of Things, right? And sometimes I think to, you know, my home furnace and a lot of the appliances in my home, and we're able to monitor those similar to how we're able to monitor uh, the brewing or the, you know, nuclear reactor or what have you. Um, you know, do you think that those are going to pose some real risk in the beginning and we're going to have to take a lessons learned as to, you know, what can happen before we learn to secure it? Yeah, I, I expect all that stuff to get pretty much owned. Um, the interesting thing is because it's kind of in the forefront of all the media right now, uh, it's probably going to get looked at sooner. But there's definitely going to be a backlash uh, when nobody actually implements anything securely. Um, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting, but I, I guess in terms of the security of that stuff, then, uh, there's an internet of things thing or whatever that is, shouldn't be any more or less secure than, uh, than the, than the nuclear, you know, power plant or something like that. It should all be as good as it gets. And, and the reality is, is all that stuff has been implemented and done already. So there's really no reason why. They can't actually make it more secure. Yeah. yeah, like Corey said, they're just trying to save money, so they don't care. Yeah, you think it's a, a economics is the primary driver behind the insecurity yeah. of things, right? Uh, Definitely. Yeah, I think that's universally true. Mm. Interesting. Um, are there any devices that uh, that you guys are looking at that are particularly interesting? Interesting, you know, good lessons learned on how to do security wrong, how to do security right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a long list of stuff that we'd probably get in trouble for saying, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's been it's been pretty fun to look at stuff. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, I'm looking at right now is uh, is um, kind of you know how the insurance companies will kind of give you dongles to plug into your into your uh, OBD2. Yeah. Uh, which I th which to me it sounds scary as hell because why are you connecting CAN bus to to uh, cellular networks, um, so oh wait, I, I think so what? So how does how into. does that work? So I get something to plug in my OBD2 port, and it over three four G talks well, to yeah, my want, yeah, insurance. It wants to make sure that you're as good a driver as you say you are, Paul. Oh. And you're not slamming on your brakes all the time, and then it reports that data back, and then you get super discounts. I would be charged a whole hell of a lot more money <laughs> when I drive my Mini. <laughs> or you get pwned and uh, somebody has straight access to your Canvas over cell network. But we're, yeah. you know, don't worry about that. Right. I'm more worried about my insurance at that point. Exactly. Right. Funny how you we, we as people work, right? Um, well, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, we, we've talked a lot about hacking cars. Uh, I've become somewhat of a, more of a car enthusiast uh, in hacking my own car, more for horsepower purposes actually than anything else so um yeah that's funny that's what that's sort of been one of the other projects that especially ken has been focused on the CAN bus for that side mm. some with ecu firmwares and stuff yes as as a as a i guess i'm, I'm more of a like down in the weeds type of guy and uh 
So I've been looking at the, the ECUs for a couple of different vehicles recently. And it, it's funny how everybody's like, oh, yes, car hacking is such a big deal. And it's so easy because you can, you know, send these messages and crazy stuff happens. But uh, I, I mean, I, I've been I've been hacking embedded stuff for a long time. So the first thing that I did when I looked at the wire and I saw these messages going across, I'm like, well, what if I twiddle these bits? Does that cause the ECU to get upset or something? And it turns out that there is actually exploits against ECUs. Nobody seems to be finding them. They're just replaying messages. But you can totally inject your own hardware or your own uh, firmware into the streams and, yeah. you know, have it execute it. And, you know, I we basically, uh, Corey and I have been working on a project where we basically exploit an ECU, uh, inject our own firmware into it, and have it, you know, be there across reboots and things like that. It, at the end of the day, it's just another computer. Sure, people yeah. call it an ECU, but... It's well, still very ownable. And what's interesting, Ken, is it, it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about ICS networks, right? Like once you're on the network, you're completely trusted. It sounds like the network in the car is the same same deal. It's very, very similar, yes. They inherently trust uh, whoever you say you are. If you say you're the you know, brakes, then they just trust you, and it's, mm -hmm. it's cool. Yeah. You don't have to actually verify that by any means. <laughs> but now people have been doing that kind of hacking for some time. Right. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You Dub did that through the tire pressure, through the media system, and those are, those are all connected to the same CAN bus. Uh, actually, our friend um, Chris just had his vehicle recalled uh, in order to separate the the entertainment bus from the CAN bus. So at least the manufacturers are kind of figuring out that maybe that's a bad idea, right. and uh, and creating multiple buses. But but yeah, it's a little bit like ICS in that regard, where uh, you we're we're exploiting the ECU, but really you don't have to do that. Where it's not even close to needing that yet, because you can just replay messages and everybody trusts you anyway. So, you actually you actually brought up a really good point that people have been doing this for a very long time. Um, this is no different than hacking was in the '90s. Uh, the only difference is that now people care mm -hmm. and are looking. Uh, but yeah, basically all of the security principles that I guess have been developed since the '90s don't really exist in these types of networks. Yeah. Although I would argue, and I should probably get in trouble for this, but all of the security practices developed since then aren't really all that effective anyway. Interesting. Uh, it's funny you say that. That's I've been rubbing my nose in that for for weeks now with the, an upcoming uh, history of infosec talk. And oh, uh, cool. You know, I'm starting out with the uh, with people in early infosec, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, sounding like the old fart I am, sounding even older than I am. You know, if you look at the the work done on things like Multics, uh, practical, handy for your iPad? No, not really. But there were some foundational ideas that uh, sort of got abandoned when things got commoditized. And it's one thing to commoditize my iPad. It's another thing to commoditize your ICS uh, platforms. Yeah. Mm. Right. <clears throat> if you guys had to have some cost-effective ways in which manufacturers of embedded systems could improve security, you know, what would that list look like? I, I would, I'll start. I'll start. I would say modern software design principles. Number one. Mm -hmm. Number one. Uh, but, well, that's I'm a, I'm a CS guy, so I might be biased. But you know, you don't have to write things in C. You don't need memory management languages. Uh, write stuff where uh, you can use unit tests. Um, I'm I'm a convert. You, uh, I've found religion, uh, and unit testing is is it. To quote Egypt uh, on Metasploit. Um, hmm. But it's. Uh, if you can, you know, you, you all the benefits to modern software design principles just are not there whatsoever. And so I would say that one of the biggest things is to get into get into that and build your systems in a way where you can test them uh, for re remediation or refactoring code. Uh, you'll know if something breaks uh, and, and you can take advantage of all the modern software de design principles that have really improved the state, I would, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> I'd like to see um, I'd like to see everybody building these systems to revisit their their basic security principles. Um, Assuming they that, have them, in that in that nothing uh, nothing on a network is inherently trusted, or it certainly right. shouldn't be. <laughs> Just because you're on the network doesn't mean you get to win. Uh, uh, and and that's something that we've been developing with this project we're working on. Is I want to see point to point trust relationships as opposed to you're there and I trust you, or you say you are and I trust you. Uh, so, so, so that's what I want to see. I don't, I don't want to have um, basically to install extra devices on a network to 
to ensure that there's a trust relationship. I just want it to work uh, from the ground up. Yeah, so I guess to, to parallel, yeah, to get into our project a little bit, how we address the problem was, uh, like Ken said, each thing has a unique key relationship. So if there's a, a temperature sensor that controls a valve, they have an individual key, and then the data that they pass is JSON back and forth. So uh, like JSON parsers are a solved problem. So people don't have to write their own parser, huh, which is still a very common issue. Uh, so you can you can take advantage of basically we we were lazy when we made this project. I guess is what it comes down to. Maybe maybe what we would say in summary is that these companies should be lazier and take advantage of all the work that's been done over the past decades uh, in each of these fields. Cool. Uh, did anyone else have questions for Corey and Ken? Joff, Jack. You. No. That means we're on to the five questions. Oh, man. Okay. Are you guys ready to play five questions? Five questions. Sure. So I will sure. ask each question of you, uh, of each of you. Well, well, anyway, they're going to be a surprise because obviously you haven't seen them, which is always fun. Okay. So, Corey, you first. Three right. words to describe yourself. I just want to help. Can I cheat and make wanna sure. one word? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. All right. We're pretty flexible on the rules. Ken, three words to describe yourself. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's go with... Uh, I'm a hacker. I... Let's see. Oh, I thought I'm that was asshole. three. I'm a hacker. Oh, okay. Definitely an asshole. Hacker, hacker yes. asshole. Got it. And uh, let's see. I wear black all the time. So black. It's Ken, funny. so I'll start with you this time. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, uh, my forty-four Magnum. Nice. Excellent choice. Definitely. Corey? Uh, weapon of choice. I'm going to go with Christopher Walken from the video. If you wrote a book about yourself, Corey, what would the title be? Um... How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Skatas. Ken? Um, firewalls are bad. Ken, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Uh, I think first is better. Corey? Uh, I'm, I'm going to take the opposite position and say second because I really feel like that way you can judge how uh, the other person wants to play Ask Grabby Grabby. You guys make an excellent Ask Grabby Grabby team. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, no um, Corey, if you could pick two celebrities to be your parents, who would they be? To be my parents? Um, Kermit the Frog and Susan Sarandon. Excellent. I think that's a record time <laughs> answer for that question. <laughs> yeah, and I, I have no idea why, but you win. I mean, just yeah. that's I, that's hmm. yeah, yeah. Ken, uh, let's go with uh, Anna Korvakova, and let's go with Homer Simpson. Nice, nice. Jack is uh, uh, making reference to my answers to the question, which are Robert Downey Jr. and Betty White. <laughs> oh, okay. Those are excellent choices. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a great pairing. Yeah, that's um, pretty good. All righty, guys. Well, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Yeah, thanks um, for having us. Yes. Yeah, there, there was, yeah, I'm thanks, sorry. Guys. There was someone like trying to get in here. This is the second person that thought this was the cigar lounge. Oh, the first person was much better looking than, than the older gentleman who was delivering food. Which we probably would have taken. So what are you guys going to do for your next career since this problem of this whole ICS skated thing will be solved within a matter of months? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> well, we're, yeah, we're going to do a little Kickstarter to see if we can fund the open source of our stuff and get it uh, commercially available. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. We got our jobs in SCADA after this. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'll farm. <laughs> yeah. I'll uh, raise pigs. Good so luck. where can people find more information about your project? Go to uh, Besser.io. It's the website for that project, and Southwork Security is our is our overriding company. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Besser IO on Twitter is available too, or each of our handles. B e s s e r dot i o. Yep, yes. that's it. Excellent. 
Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Hey, Thank thanks you. for having us. And with that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about the stories for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 